uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be asked to speak, uh, especially uh, with Bob completely out of town, so he can't, well, he's probably watching, but he can't interfere. <laughs> so I appreciate the trust, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share the Word of God with you all. Um, not that what I have to say is the Word of God, but what is what we are going to be exploring together in our Bibles. <clears throat> and uh, last time uh, Bob asked me to speak, we started looking at 1 John, and we covered chapter 1 and for a little bit of chapter 2 as we looked at what John had for us to learn about having peace and joy as we have fellowship with the Lord. And that's all well and good, but the logical question that should come from an, a, a purpose statement that you have joy, you have intimacy with the Lord, you have, you have uh, peace through fellowship, the logical next question should be, well, okay, that's great, I'm in, how? Um, how is, a, is an important feature when you're telling somebody they need to do a thing, especially if they not, maybe not have done it before. Uh, so what we want to look at today is the process of knowing fellowship, experiencing it, being intimate with it, uh, having a confidence not just in our eternal life, but in our, our, our spiritual walk, our spiritual life that it's growing, that it hasn't, become, uh, it hasn't become restricted, it hasn't been held back, it hasn't been uh, blockaded by something. How do we know that we have fellowship? So we'll be examining 1 John 2, 3 through 14, and understanding, hopefully understanding, uh, how we can know that we have fellowship. As, whoop, ah, there, yeah, anyway. Yeah, it's 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 14. That was what that last slide was. It's important that we remember where we're coming from. In chapter 1, we saw John's purpose. He said in John 1, 3, and 4, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So right there, he says, we want you to have fellowship with us, and fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. First of all, we want to have fellowship. The purpose of having fellowship is to be closer with each other in Christ and with Christ. And then that will lead to a fullness of joy. And as we talked about last time, peace. As we fully and totally become intimate with the Lord and with each other. We are, peace. we are at peace because we have that closeness. We know we're not at war with those around us and those who are walking the same path and we're on the same road. We're in the light, as we'll see this week. Remember, this is very important as we look at 1 John. I cannot stress this enough, that no passage in the Bible questions or is intended to bring into question the eternal destination of one who has faith in Christ. If you take nothing away that I tell you today other than this, take this with you as you go. No passage in Scripture questions or is intended to bring into question one, the eternal destination of one who has had simply had nothing more, nothing less than faith in Christ. We're going to be looking at things today that are often misconstrued and used to steal the peace from people. They are used to steal the confidence that you should have in Christ. But we know that that's not true. We know that these things are meant for something more important than simply, not more important, but more deep than simply getting us to heaven when we die. It's about our life that we live between then and now, and how can we be in fellowship with him, have true intimacy with him, and not just be a 
survivor of eternity, but be a thriver in eternity. Because if you just want to get there, if you think the entire Christian life is just about making it out of the flames, then your whole perspective on God and Christ and our life here on earth is going to be skewed with fear and doubt. But the good news is that we don't have that. We have assurance. We have confidence. And we know, like I say here, no passage in Scripture should bring us to question our eternal destination if we have had faith in Christ for eternal life. And that's an important thing that I want to bring up. The passage we're going to be looking at today is not written to unbelievers. If you have not believed in Christ for eternal life, what I'm going to tell you today is nonsense to you. You will not grow closer to God by following what we're going to talk about today. You will not grow closer to God. You will not become more likely to have eternal life if you follow these rules and regulations, which they aren't rules and regulations, but if you follow a certain set of rules and regulations, if you follow a code, if you follow a path, and none of that will help. It's only exclusively faith in Christ that gives you eternal life. The passages in Scripture that are about discipleship, and this is a key passage about discipleship, are only for those in the family. You cannot serve God if you think he is going to throw you into hell, you can only serve God when you're his child. Let us begin. What do we know about knowing? There's a lot been said over the years about knowing things. Everyone wants to know about what's going on, what's coming next, what's the stock market going to do, I'd like to know that. Uh, what, I mean, anything that might happen, we want to know. Anything that is happening, we want to know. The internet brings us knowledge. It brings us the, uh, the, the goings on, people's opinions, what isn't going on, people's theories, conspiracy theories, tinfoil hattery. It brings it all to you. But what is knowledge? What is knowing? The world tells us that the only true wisdom comes in knowing that you know nothing. If you look at the world around us today, you can see that by this standard, the world knows a lot right now. Uh, they think that men and women are interchangeable. They think that uh, truth is falsehood, that children are just lumps of tissue, and that, uh, that our elections are completely trustworthy. Anyway, um, we only know by not knowing. Well, that seems odd. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, The Lord giveth, giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. We talked about this last time. Many false religions tell us to meditate, fill our minds with nothing. What does the scripture tell us to do when we meditate? To fill our minds with the word of God. Why? Because the Word of God brings knowledge and understanding, and without knowledge and understanding, you cannot be successful in anything. I don't care if you're trying to build a house. If you don't know how to build a house, you're going to build a disaster. Right? If you're going to write a computer program and you don't know how to code, the beginning of knowledge is not saying, I don't know how to code, I'm going to make a program. No, you need to understand how you're going to do something, right? The Lord gives wisdom. Out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. The Lord's words are knowledge and understanding. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And we can see that in the world today. Everything is despised if it's true. You know, I, when I was growing up, I thought it was so crazy that anybody would ever, ever, say that good was evil and evil is good and yet every day you turn the news on you have somebody else articulating in great passion the goodness of evil and the evil of good and that love is hate and that hate is love it's it's insane we live in a crazy world but what does that tell us about what we need to be doing as believers as brothers and sisters in christ how 
do we live? Well, we live by pursuing fellowship, right? That's what we learned about last time. John wants us to be closer to each other and closer to God. That brings us joy. So what do we do to have, what do we do so we know that we have this? Well, you can say, I, if I feel happy, right? That's joy. No, that's not joy. joy uh, happy is an emotion. Joy is a kind of state of being. It's a, it's a peacefulness. It's an abiding thing that lasts. It's not things are going well today, but if it rains when I'm out walking tomorrow, I'm going to be unjoyful. That's not how it works. That's an emotion. So let's take a look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. John tells us, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Here we see John doing a couple of things. He makes a truth claim. He says that if we know him, we keep his commandments. Is this a, is this a test of life? By the way, I'm not going to detail the arguments. Most of the time folks get tied up in the arguments of why this doesn't mean eternal life. No, he's not talking about we know we have eternal life by keeping his commandments. He's talking about that we know him, right? Knowledge of God is not a requirement for eternal life. Faith in Christ for eternal life is the requirement for eternal life. Knowing him is about becoming more knowledgeable about him. We know him. We are intimate with him. We have this relationship with him if we keep his commandments. It's a test for us to apply to ourselves to say, am I operating as someone who knows God? Should we operate as believers, as someone who knows God? Absolutely. Because we've been died for. We've been bled for. We've been suffered for. He knows us. We should know him. As believers in Christ, those who possess eternal life, even more so because we know how wonderful the gift has been, that is that we've been given. So we should be trying to know him better, know him more. So we should try and keep his commandments. What are his commandments? Oh, it's the Ten Commandments. Really? Christ didn't say keep the Ten Commandments. All right? He healed people on the Sabbath day. He walked places on the Sabbath day. He, didn't exactly, he wasn't exactly... Uh, the world's most exacting uh, Pharisee. In fact, he got in quite a bit of trouble with the Pharisees because he wasn't keeping their legalistic commandments. He was keeping the, the law of God perfectly. Let's keep moving. Uh, <clears throat> beyond knowing, what's more than knowing? Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him, and this, by this we know we are in him. So not just knowing, it's being in him. He who abides in him ought himself also walk just as he walked. So we see another question. Are we keeping his word? Why do we want to keep his word? Because we want to be in him. We want to be uh, abiding in him. We want to be, what does abiding mean? It means living in. It means living with. We want to be not just, oh, we know that guy. We live like we know him because he's influenced me. We want to be like, living with God because he's not just our buddy, he's our savior, and we're going to live with him for eternity, so we should be trying to abide in him, to live like we are family with him, and we should be imitating him, not intimidating, but in imitating, can't not say that word this morning, we should be imitating him, we should walk as he walked, how did he walk, in love, in care, we're going to see that so what does all this mean? It's nothing new, but yet it is. Chapters, uh, chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, John says something kind of interesting that can get a little confusing. He says, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word of God, the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which, is, which thing is true in him and, and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So he says, it's nothing that you haven't heard, but it is new. It's something you've had from the beginning, but it's brand new. So what is this thing? Well, if you look at Christ's life, so we have, we should be doing his commandments and we should be walking as he walked. So during Christ's life, what did he do? Well, 
he told us that we should do something different, something that's not an Old Testament commandment. It is, in John 13, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another, and by this you will know that you are my disciples, they all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The new commandment, and we'll see this contextually, don't worry, I'm not just jumping around for no reason. The new commandment is to show love for each other. Right? It's something that they've had since the beginning of Christianity, from the beginning of following Christ. It's, it was the, one of the early things that they had, a commandment from Christ. Love each other as I've loved you. What does that mean? That means self-sacrificially. That means thinking of others first. It means loving as somebody that you care about. Who? Our brothers, our real blood brothers, our blood sisters, our mom and our dad, yes, but specifically as believers in Christ, our first responsibility, very first responsibility, is to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are called to love one another. That is our first commandment. That is our first rule. As we go through 1 John, we'll see that we actually have two. We have to love one another as Christ loved us, and then to continue to believe in Jesus Christ. Those are our two things to do. We love. Now, you're like, well, that's easy. The, the, the Old Testament folks had 600-odd uh, laws. I can handle one. No, you can't. It's tough. <laughs> Loving people, especially people who are not you, is very difficult. Some people have a hard time even loving on themselves. But truth is, is that it's very difficult to love each other, especially in a world who says it's so easy to just go find love someplace else. Well, what is Christ's love? Christ's love is one without condition. It's self-sacrificial. And it is trying to build people up. We are called to love each other as Christ loved us, being willing to do what we need to do to love each other. How do we stay in the light? John tells us there in, at the end of verse 8 that the darkness is passing away and the light is already shining. What's the light? The light is, as we looked at a couple weeks ago when I was talking about chapter 1, the light is the presence of God that we can enjoy and experience as believers in Christ. And we can only be there when we're in fellowship. So if the light's shining, we should want to be in it. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness. It's not you're going to hell. It means that you're not in fellowship. If you don't love your brother in Christ, you are not showing love and you are not in fellowship. Horizontal relationships within the church. That means me to you, you to me, you, you to the person on either side and front and back of you in the pew and all throughout the church, and all throughout the greater body of believers, that relationship is the one that we can actually see, right? We can see that we're having good relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's hard to see. I mean, I've, I've tried to have two-way conversations, you know, chatting about my day with the Lord. I have yet to hear anything back. But we can talk to our brothers and sisters in Christ we can share with them. We can encourage them. They can encourage us or not. That's okay. Our, our job individually is to love the other person, not to receive love. It's to give it, right? It is, it is love without preconditions. I'll love you as long as you love me is the way the world loves us or loves each other. The way we love as believers in Christ, followers of Christ, is to love without requirement, Love our brothers in Christ. Love our sisters in Christ. And everybody can have a brother or sister in Christ if you're a believer. It's the people around you who are believers. He who loves his brother abides in the light. If we are loving in this way, if we are caring for each other in this way, we're abiding in the light. And it says not only are we abiding in it, it's if we are actually living out this love, there's, it removes, the light removes reasons for stumbling in front of us. Why is that? If, it, if you think about it as a walk, it makes sense. If you're walking in darkness, what are you going to do? 
As somebody who walks around at night quite a lot on my farm, it's hard to find the potholes or anthills or cinder blocks or small furry woodland creatures. They're out there and they like to lay down in front of you or dig a hole in front of you and you will fall in it unless you don't have a flashlight. But if you're in the light, you can see them, right? When the sun is shining, when your flashlight is working and you're walking through the field, you can see the rock, you can see the anthill, you can see the furry woodland creature before you step on it and it makes it, you make it mad. No, you have the light and it removes reasons for stumbling. Illumination of our lives as we love each other in fellowship with Christ and fellowship with each other. However, if we hate our brother in Christ, if we hate our brother, we're in darkness. Alternative to being in the light, alternative to love is hate, indifference, not caring, not loving. And really, as far as scripture is concerned, you really only have two options, positively loving, that means definitely loving, actually perf being, uh, performing acts of love and, and being loving, and anything else, indifference, is just as bad as hatred. Right? If, you hate, if you don't care, that's just as bad as hatred. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. If you don't know where you're going, what are you going to do? Stumble and fall. So we see three areas of fellowship. We see knowing in verses 3 and 4. We see abiding in verses 5 and 6. And we see illuminating in 9, 10, and 11. For knowing, we're called to keep his commandments. We're imperfect. The Bible, the, the Bible nowhere, including here, tells us that we have to be perfect to be in fellowship. In fact, what we studied last time, verses 1, two and, uh, one and 2 in chapter 2, tell us everyone sins. Everyone sins, but Christ is our propitiation for that sin. In other words, it's already been paid for. Okay. Uh, it, the Bible never calls on us to be perfect. He tells us that we are being made perfect because we have the blood of Christ that will wash, us away, wash away all the imperfections from us in eternity. What are we going to experience now? Difficulty, struggle, failure. The mercy and grace of God because we will fail. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us out of all unrighteousness. Not talking about eternal life. Talking about we are believers in Christ. We want to have fellowship. We have failed knowing him today. We have failed abiding in him today. We have wandered into the darkness. How do we get back? How do we start knowing him again? How do we start abiding with him again? How do we get back in the light? We ask. We agree. And we're returned. And then we can start back. Sometimes we have to not just confess to Christ. Sometimes we have to confess to our brother in Christ who we were not loving to. As a kid, that was tough. Especially because that person, my brother in Christ was usually my brother, who I was not loving to. And it's tough to tell your little brother, hey, sorry, I was wrong. As like a 15-year-old kid, talking to a 12-year-old kid, not an easy thing to do. <laughs> Nobody wants to tell their little brother, you were right and I was wrong. Especially when he's obnoxiously usually right. That's why he's an engineer. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, so... We have three areas of fellowship that we can check on. Are we knowing him? Are we keeping his commandments? Are we abiding with him, trying to imitate his life? Are we living in the illumination of the presence of God? And I mean that not in some kind of charismatic weird sense, but in the presence of his word, having it in our minds, in our lives, just abiding in it. Are we there? Are we loving each other? Because that shows us that's the final thing, man. It shows us, are we in fellowship? If you're not in fellowship, it's an easy fix. It might not be a comfortable fix, but it's a guaranteed fix, and it's, it's a doable fix for all of us. We, we talk to God, get it right with him. We talk to our brother in Christ, get it right with them. And off we go. All right, we're back in fellowship. The Lord always has the door open for a return to fellowship. 
horizontal fellowship and vertical fellowship are tied together. We see that in chapter 1. We see that in chapter 2. Uh, having fellowship with God without fellowship with our fellow believers is impossible. You can't be the man on the island forever. If you are isolating yourself, not coming to church, not being with your brothers and sisters in Christ for any reason, fear or disinterest or indifference, you're not having fellowship. You're not having fellowship with each other. You're with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And you're not having fellowship with God, at least not as deep as you could. You can be a student of the word, but if you never engage with your brothers in Christ, you will not be what you could be. Which brings me to the next section, that we should know who we are. Since... We've just been looking at how can we have fellowship. Why does that matter? Why do we care? Yeah, I want to have peace, but you know, I'll make it. I'm going to go to heaven anyway. Well, that's, we should know who we are. John writes to the people. In, if, in your Bible, if you're reading in, 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 a, in, a, in a dead tree version of the Bible, uh, you will see this as in a different font. And, uh, this is some kind of poem or song that is a it's a recitation of who we are in Christ who we are in life as following uh, as believers pursuing fellowship with God John writes I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his namesake I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. We are little children who needed to be rescued. Christ has miraculously come, bled and died, and given us an opportunity to believe in him for eternal life, and that's all that it takes. We are like little children who needed to be rescued. Our sins are forgiven. We're ready to go. It's interesting that Paul, or John, sorry, I say Paul all the time because I'm usually teaching out of Paul. But uh, it's interesting that John writes, that our, instead of talking to like the, the age progression, he talks to the fathers next. The, the part, we are fathers, be, we are these, a mature leading figure because we have known him who is from the beginning. If we are in fellowship with God, we know him. And he is from the beginning. And that illuminates our mind. That helps us to understand the scriptures. And he says, I write to you young men, the strong, the capable, right? The ones who are able to, as we talked about this morning in in Bible fellowship, looking at Caleb, who was not a young man, but he still had the strength of a young man. uh, A person capable of going out to war and surviving and coming back in. The young part, the young man, we, the, one, the young men are capable because they've overcome the wicked one. And he's not talking to children, to fathers, to young men. He's talking to us because we are little children who needed to be rescued. We are mature fathers who know him, him and have intimate knowledge of the Lord and of his word and of his will. Even if we're just beginning our spiritual journey and our spiritual growth in Christ, We know him. We know the creator God of the universe. We have intimate knowledge. We have wisdom beyond our years. And we are young men who have been given and have taken the victory over the wicked one, over the devil, over the world, over even our own flesh. It's there for us. It's who we are. John goes on. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. Like little children... We need to know our Father. I've written to you fathers because you have known Him who is from the beginning. Again, he says the same thing. How can somebody know, have any greater knowledge, have any greater wisdom, have any greater understanding than to know the mind and heart of God, which He has shown us in His Word? I've written to you young men because you are strong and the Word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Again, He writes to the young men, he says, you have overcome. 
because you're strong and the word of God abides in you. It's not because they're young men. I'm sure some of the people he was writing to were old or women, you know, or children. It doesn't matter. Because a believer has the word of God, they're strong like a young warrior, capable, the word of God abiding within them, having overcome the wicked one. It's interesting. Overcoming is a thing that's done for these, for this perspective. If you go into the book of Revelation and other writings of John, overcoming is not a sure thing yet. That's because he's talking about a different thing. You can't, you can't cross-thread two different books, right? John is telling us, hey, this is a thing that's been done. We've already overcome through faith, through Christ. So, we know who we are. We have these three areas that we talked about before. Knowing him, abiding in him, being illuminated by uh, the living in the light, by having the love for each other. None of these tests are tests of life. This is evidence that we see these three verses here, verses uh, 12, 13, and 14. He's saying this is a fact about you. He's not saying if you are faithful, if you stay true. This is something that's already done. We don't have to wonder if we fail. Are we his child? If we fail, did we forget him? Has he forgotten us? No. <laughs> it's done. We are already. Our sins are already forgiven. Our knowledge of the Father is there. It just means you're in the darkness for a little bit. And you can fix that quite easily. Why should we care if we have no fear of hell? If you read the majority of commentaries about 1 John, they will tell you it's about knowing that you, don't, that you have eternal life. It's telling you that you, this is how you know, this is how you have assurance. I tell you, and we say this all the time, but it bears repeating, and it's like I said at the beginning, no scripture is intended to question or bring into question the eternal destination of one who has faith in Christ. These are not tests of eternal life. They're tests of fellowship. Are we walking with him? Do, are we knowing him? Are we living in him? Are we loving our brothers and sisters in Christ, thereby walking in the light, removing areas of stumbling from before us? Why should we care? Why should we care to have fellowship? Well, we talked about this last time. Uh, we talked about how it brings peace if we're in fellowship. The purpose of John is to bring joy. Why do we care? Well, I, I mean, you might say, oh, I mean, I'm happy enough. It's good enough. Good enough doesn't, isn't all we've been promised, folks. We've been promised something that goes beyond good enough. We talked this morning again about the idea of God's ability to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. God has given us the opportunity. God has given us the ability. God has given us the promise that we can, if we, if we want to, have an even deeper level of joy, an even deeper level of knowledge of him, an even deeper level of contentment, of peace, of assurance. This doesn't override, this doesn't change the assurance that we have when we believe in him because we're believing in his promise. It makes it deeper. It makes it more meaningful. It makes it more powerful in our lives as we apply the word of God to what we do. A believer in fellowship knows a deeper assurance, greater confidence, lasting peace, powerful hope, contentment in life, no fear in death, and a more beautiful joy forever. It's not based on it's not based on some feeling, it's not based on some moment in time, it's based on our fellowship with him. We're called to it. This is a constant, a life, a mission. We are called to fellowship with him. We're called to this intimacy, this closeness. Again, I, I repeat it again. We are called to know him. We're called to live with him and be illuminated by him. Right? To, to see where we're going. 
The argument that free grace has no reason to live or walk in the Lord is absurdly false. We simply have a deeper and more meaningful relationship with God than simply fire insurance. Right? If, if you are only looking at your life to verify that you have eternal life, well, let me tell you folks, you're always going to find failure. You're always going to find reason to doubt if you're looking at yourself. You're called to look to Christ for your eternal assurance. Why do we look at ourselves? We look at ourselves to check to see if we're following him. Are we living in pursuit of him? Are we after what has been offered? What's been offered? Eternal intimacy with Christ. Eternal closeness with the King. Remember, folks, we are not simply people of God. We're not simply those folks who happen to be in a certain area at a certain time. No, we are adopted children of God. We are in the family. And we have an opportunity not just to go to heaven. That's a gift. Anybody who believes gets to go to heaven. Gets to live eternally in, 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 in the kingdom. No, we've been offered something more than that. We've been offered the opportunity to inherit alongside Christ. To be given more than simply life, but to get, be given abundance in eternity. And in this life, we can have more assurance. We can say, yes, I am not just going to heaven, but I know that I am walking closely with God. As Paul did, he, he knew, not because of some mystical nonsense, but because he pursued God, he knew that he had a reward waiting for him. You can see this in 2 Timothy, right before he dies. He says, I have run the, good, I have run the race, I have finished the course, I have fought the fight. Right before he dies. He knows he's done. We have greater confidence. When we act for God, when we act with love, showing love. Like, how big of a risk is it to show love with no preconditions? Man, it's a huge risk. You can be completely taken advantage of people, by people. Taken advantage of by people. There's the words. But we can have confidence that we're acting out the love of God towards folks. And if we get, if we get uh, stymied, if somebody, if somebody takes advantage of us, okay, that's fine. We were showing the love of God. Lasting peace. Man, it's a tough world that we live in right now, especially tough as a believer. The peace of eternity and the peace of the kingdom and the confidence that we have in Christ's it, Coming and his kingdom on earth is something that provides a powerful, powerful motivator to continue to live for him rather than just try and make it by clawing our way. And man, that brings contentment. That brings contentment. If we are living in fellowship, we will be content. If we are fighting against it, we are in trouble. We are going to have a miserable life. And that leads to no fear for death and a confidence in eternal bountiful joy. And that is what we want. We want to have peace. We want to know Christ. We want to abide in him and we want to be, walk in an illuminated path. It is not an easy road. That's why we're called to it. If it was a gift, if something we were just given, we wouldn't be commanded to do it. If it was something we would do anyway, we wouldn't be called to do it. If it was something that we could just take for granted after we get started, we wouldn't be given things that we can check on. Are we there? Are we in line? Know him and have joy. That's why we care. We want to have joy. We want to please our Father. If that doesn't motivate you, we want to please your King. What have you been given? You've been given the life of Christ, the blood of Christ for yours. So many reasons to be motivated. Fear of death, fear of eternal separation is not one of them. What a wonderful gift we've been given. 
that we can live in confidence, live powerfully for God with no fear of failure. Yes, we will fail, but we shouldn't fear it. We should know that when we do, we can come right back and be in fellowship again. Folks, I hope that we can all find opportunities throughout the week to love each other, love our brothers and sisters in Christ, not in some kind of emotional way, but in a real self-sacrificial, not expecting anything back kind of way. We're different from the world. We've been called to more. We should live like it. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can call you Father. You've brought us into the family. Lord, help us to know you as our Father. Help us to help us to to embrace the victory that we've been given. Lord, help us to love each other. Because if we can't, how can we demonstrate to the world the truth? Lord, help us to walk in fellowship with you. Help us to have the peace that comes with that. Help us to know it. Help us to apply it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you all for your kind attention.